Thank you very much, Luis, and thank you to the organizers for a wonderful opportunity to share with you our passion for applying technology in medicine, and hopefully, as the title of my talk uh, states, enhancing patient safety in the end through, through medical, through engineering technologies. So I think this work would, would not have been possible without acknowledging the team of uh, wonderful co-workers and friends in mind, body, and spirit, truly. Alan Hamilton is sort of my medical mentor. Uh, some of the folks who already have a degree behind their name are clearly folks who graduated from my program, and many of my students are in the audience as well. Uh, what I wanted to do is to essentially discuss with you a particular aspect of surgery, specifically minimally invasive surgical procedures, with, whom, with, with which you, you may have some experience. I mean, judging statistically from the audience, many of you are so young that hopefully you haven't gone, undergone any procedures, but maybe you had your appendix removed, perhaps uh, you had your gallbladder removed. Uh, so you're familiar with the laparoscopic uh, procedures. Uh, what is it all about? In essence, uh, long instruments uh, like this. I brought some props, obviously. I'm not qualified to cut anybody up, but I can program a robot to do that. And I'll talk about this tonight. Uh, we have long instruments that are introduced into uh, the body cavity. Let's say, uh, you know, if you're insufflating a patient uh, with CO2 to enlarge the operating field. You introduce the instruments, you introduce the camera, and you essentially observe the operating field through a monitor or a LED display. And I think this figure, this picture here, illustrates this process. Now, this gets a little tricky. Why is that? Because obviously you can notice uh, that, that you, you essentially, it gets so difficult as if you were to sign your name with an 18-inch 18 18 long instrument uh, while looking at a two-dimensional rendition of essentially what is a three-dimensional spa uh, space. So the bottom line is that clearly why the benefits are ob obvious. Uh, much less pain, much quicker recovery time, much less uh, blood loss. This is a very difficult technique and statistically the first 50 of these procedures uh, have a higher error of rates. So what we want to do, what we're truly after, is we would like to develop, obviously, some techniques to allow you to, or allow medical students, residents, surgeons, to train in environments that perhaps uh, provide a higher level of, of experience, rather than having actually students work on animals or perhaps train on patients. So the key motivation be behind what we're doing is we would like to reduce the rate of errors. And unfortunately, that rate is still a little bit too high. Systems, these are systems that perhaps we could easily state they are life critical. I basically quote here a, a colleague from NASA. This sounds very dramatic, but indeed, medicine is very serious business. If these systems fail, people may die. Clearly, we'd like to obviously draw from a very, very vast repository of simulation-based techniques, modeling-based techniques, to replace animal labs with computer-assisted models. I think it really makes a lot of sense, especially in light of what we have available today in terms of the underlying technologies. So, you know, I, I hope the irony of this cartoon is not lost on you. Uh, you know, I wanted to lighten the topic up just a little bit. I hope you can read it from the back. You know, there's a consortium of, a concilium of doctors here sitting and reading this very difficult to decipher piece of paper. And are we, are we really committing 90,000, 98,000 errors or 90, 90 errors? Or are we supposed to report them or repeat them? So, you know, putting the jokes aside, what really we're after is the kind of inspiration that, that has been is that is stemming from a lot of the work that's been done in aviation. I don't know how many of you are flying pilots, but I'm sure you're very familiar with the field, which is incredibly safe. And it's due to very, very rigorous uh, application of not only technology, but certain procedures, such as checklists. And 
Many of you, I'm sure, have heard about Dr. Atul Gawande, who wrote really an excellent book about two years ago called The Checklist Manifesto. You all know that before a takeoff or right prior to landing, the pilots in the cockpit go through a series of checklists. And Dr. Gawande recommends it very, very highly that essentially this is the same thing that the surgical team should do prior to actually commencing any procedure. Uh, WHO has an excellent initiative now on safe surgery. They are pushing this uh, very, very strongly. Obviously, the sort of analogies uh, from NASA on life critical systems also come into play. It's very interesting because if you really look at the, the list of topics I have stated here, they all sort of stem from, from our experience in aviation. So I just wanted to give you just a little bit of background of what's in place and then perhaps jump into the work that we have done and share with you what's already in place and what we are dreaming about and, and what we're really hoping to implement ultimately in the operating room. So on the one end of the spectrum, what we have is commercially available trainers that allow a student or a resident or a surgeon who wants to specialize in endoscopic laparoscopic surgery uh, to train in a setting that's semi-realistic. Semi On the one hand, you know, you, you kind of have a device that obviously doesn't look like the operating table. On the other hand, you have a pretty good rendition of the operating field view. Uh, you have virtual organs that are displayed on the monitor and you work with fixtures that more or less resemble an actual surgical instrument. So uh, is this a good, good way to sort of train people? Obviously it is. It provides uh, a spectrum of training exercises, but it's prohibitive in terms of cost. It's very difficult to equip UMC with 20 of these. You know, the, range, the cost ranges from about you know, 150,000 to perhaps 250,000. On the other end of the spectrum, what we have, and I have to back up just a little bit, uh, what we have is, is really quite primitive wooden boxes or plastic boxes that are called pelvi trainers. So what you do is you have a trainee essentially inserting the, the actual instruments into, into uh, a cloth, kind of a rubber band, and manipulate the instruments on some sort of a rendition of a particular organ. Here we have some rendition of a pelvis underneath, uh, what, are, what are the benefits, what are the drawbacks? The benefit is it's quite cheap, you can easily set this up. Uh, at the same time, you know, you, you, you don't really have much in terms of force feedback, you don't have any uh, sense of haptics, meaning, you know, when you pull on the tissue, you, 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 well, you have some sense of haptics, but it's really not very real. And you don't have any measures that allow you to know how well you have done. So, what is our vision for providing environments that would integrate uh, quote-unquote smart intelligent technologies. What we are after is kind of a um, integrated system that would start off with a trainee, in this case a medical student, resident, or a surgeon, who would work with true instruments and operate on a simulator of a particular procedure or a set of procedures. For example, it could be a suturing task. What we want to provide is also a set of metrics that tell you how well you have done. I'll jump into that in just one second and you'll get a sense for this. But in addition to being able to assess how well you have done, we'd like to provide some tutoring, some way of guidance. In other words, we'd like to have an ability to tell you where to go, how to move, where to move and at the same time give you some feedback. So in a way, if you remember growing up and a set of training wheels on your bicycle, this is sort of a concept in principle of what it is that we are after. So what are the principal features of, of the system that we already have in place? Well, for one, we can track where we are in the operating space. So if you are carrying on with a very simple task, let's say, you know, moving the instruments from the, an instrument or the set of instruments from point, point A to B, you essentially want to be able to know where you have been in the operating space. And I have some interesting pictures to show you in a minute. Uh, we want to be able to give you metrics that tell you a little more than just a case of, let's say, where you have been and where you're going. We'd like you to know how quickly you have done it, how economical you have been in your movements, how precise you have been in your movements. 
as I mentioned a minute ago, we'd like to be able to give you guidance, both visual guidance and force haptic type of guidance. And in the end, what really we're after is something that we'd call cognitive amplification, which obviously for a practicing, sur pra practicing surgeon may, may really sound like an insult that we would like to amplify their cognition. But still, in a very, very complex situation, we want to improve situational awareness. We want you to be able to know where you are and what might you be doing that's perhaps uh, not quite all right. So just to give you a sample of what a setup would look like, uh, here is, is uh, just a very, very small study uh, comparing uh, the efficiency of a high resolution monitor and a conventional monitor and a stereo monitor. We actually were looking into stereoscopic vision that we'd like to add to our training procedures. Believe it or not, despite the technology that's available, stereoscopic vision has not been very, very popular. Perhaps it'll change with the Google Glasses. But to give you a flavor of the tracking mechanism, if you, if you now take a very close look at the uh, left picture and the right picture, the green line essentially reflects the trajectory of the instrument between the various pegs of different height. And you could clearly, if you were to look at these pictures to decide whether the trainee labeled as one would do a procedure on you or trainee number two, I don't think you would have any doubt about this, would you? <laughs> There's no question about that. So this is just a simple example of, of the tracking procedure, of the tracking mechanism. But the metrics get much more sophisticated. For example, we look at the economy of movement. What does this mean? Well, how close am I to what the ideal path would be? Uh, the time. Clearly, sometimes time and speed might be of essence, especially if you're dealing with some sort of unexpected bleeding. Uh, how accurate are you? Is your direction profile correct? Are you moving in the right direction? Remember, you're viewing the operating field on a TV LED monitor while operating in a three-dimensional space. You have a lot of problems with parallax, for example. Most likely, you now see one finger, whereas a lot of the audience that sits to my right sees two fingers. So a lot of errors per perhaps stem from the lack of the depth perception. Uh, I mentioned here, this is an example again of, of the performance assessment. Notice that this was almost an ideal student who was so close to the ideal path between those points. The exercise here was to, in essence, to touch uh, the tips of those pegs with the tip of your instrument and, and to do it in quite quickly and obviously with the best accuracy available. Uh, over and above the, uh, the basic exercises, we have developed very sophisticated mathematical models that tell the trainees or the residents how well they have performed in a qualitative sense, not just quantitative sense. So they can assess themselves, am I now a beginner or a novice or somewhere in between? I will not spend much time on this because that's beyond the scope of this talk. But we have very good tools that allow you to go home and sort of gain some introspection into how well you have performed. Uh, jumping into something that's a little more sophisticated is, is the question of how we view the guidance process and the sort of highly autonomous control of the training. So again, we, we sort of draw from the no-fly zone analogy and introduce something that we call no-entry zones. So imagine that the oval inside the picture is the zone through which the tips of your instruments should essentially quote-unquote fly, and anything beyond that boundary is something that you really don't want to, or a space that you don't want to enter. So essentially, how do we sort of enforce this behavior? Well, what we have come up with is, is an idea that very much stems from uh, navigation in the robotics world, or even in aviation. So a lot of the work that's done in, uh, in, in robotics has to do with generating collision-free optimal trajectories for the robotic arm. So why not use the same methodology and sort of employ it in surgical training? And if you see here, you know, the, the tip of the instrument could, could clearly sort of glide through that safe zone. So where do we take this? Well, I wanted to display a short video. We turn the volume Lower. Backward. 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 Forward, lower. 
right. Lower, lower, lower. Lower, lower. Forward, forward, backward. Excellent. I think this is. This was a, a, a very small exercise that basically consisted of a two-handed experiment where you had to touch a uh, a point which would light up uh, in red with your left instrument and the one that would light up in, in green with uh, the right-handed instrument and bring two instruments towards a yellow light. The trainee was given only 10 seconds to do this, but notice at this point we had audio guidance and some level of visual guidance through, through a concept that's similar to a glide slope when you land the plane. Uh, basically, this is something that we are evaluating how good this audio and visual guidance would be. However, we're also very interested in sort of the, the highest level of sophistication. So we designed this fixture called, called CAS3, Computer Assisted Surgical Trainer 3, which basically incorporates a real surgical instrument. What you see here is a needle driver, which is set up in this particular fixture that allows us to get a precise position of the instrument at any point of time. And we also have servo motors that can drive this instrument autonomously through the space. So what we are after is essentially the ability to move instruments. This is just the right hand. We also have a copy of this, which is a left hand. We are able to drive these instruments along what we consider optimal approaches. So you can imagine planning a very complex operation, let's say separating conjoint twins. And then what we do is we have the underlying models, computer models that allow us to generate the best approaches. And if we want to train somebody on this, we actually can activate the motors to do it autonomously. So if you give me another 30 seconds here, you'll see that this particular instrument is now flying to the space by itself. And, but that's really not, not the ultimate purpose here. We don't really anticipate the robots to replace the surgeon. But you can easily imagine that if I am now carrying on with a particular exercise, the feedback which I get through the motors would sort of gently nudge me towards the best trajectory. So the idea here is to reinforce a particular behavior, reinforce what is considered a good move or a bad move. At the same time, if I am about to exit from what is considered a safe zone and maybe enter an unsafe zone, uh, the motor could stop me right away. So you know, we're thinking about this as a, perhaps a mechanism that could be used in real time in the operating field. So we're really transitioning from training systems that are relatively unsophisticated. They have a set of particular exercises, predefined settings, and no guidance, to systems that have not only visual, audio, but also haptic force guidance that allow the trainees to, to sort of start small and allow us to provide, at that point, a lot of assistance and gradually sort of wean them off the training wheels, to use this analogy that, that I had stated above. So if you really think about the future, I really, really think, obviously, surgery lends, it safe, lends itself tremendously well to robotics, to technology, and I think 20 years from now, we'll definitely see many more of these devices in the operating room. We are thinking about using intelligent tutoring techniques, so perhaps a trainee could take a box with them. And in fact, believe it or not, we actually filed a patent for it yesterday. Can take a box home and essentially go over a set of fundamental exercises. But in the end, what we really, really would like to provide is techniques, a set of techniques that provide better situational awareness, especially in very, very complicated procedures, and ultimately perhaps some support of surgical teams in the OR. So with that, I really would like to thank you very much for attending the talk and for sharing our vision and our dreams with you. Thank you very much.